Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> There's a prayer that I utter each day, and it is, God, give me the strength to tell and pursue the truth, especially when it's inconvenient to me. Someone once said that, I think it was George Bernard Shaw, he said, he asked the question, must a Christ die in torment in every age to save those that lack imagination? And Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. What we really need to bring to this discussion is a different way of approaching it. We've heard speakers, and I was very impressed with the, the whole presentation, but there are those who don't understand that the crisis that we're facing today is no respecter of race, is no respecter of class. The problem will not be solved through uh, therapeutic intervention. It won't be solved through public education. I remember some years ago, the National Institute of Health uh, ran these ads on, with the, uh, on television uh, that cost millions of dollars. And as you've seen, they're putting the egg on the, on, on the stove and this, this is what your brain. It is no respecter of that. And what they did after five years of running these ads, they did an evaluation and the kids who watched them were worse off than the ones who didn't. And so the point that I, I, I want to make is that drug addiction and opiate addiction it is not a rational problem that we have. A rational problem can be solved by a rational solution. And so education alone will not address that problem. If, it, if, if education were the issue, if knowledge were the issue, then you would not have people with PhDs, people with MDs, drug counselors who are drug addicts. You wouldn't have well-educated people as drug addicts if the problem were education. And so therefore, we've got to look at it at its source. I saw a study not too long ago that says that in Palo Alto, California, where 90% of the parents are two-parent households, where the median income is $160,000, that the suicide rate among its teenagers is six times the national average. Their volunteer moms and dads are standing at railroad crossings to prevent kids from jumping in front of trains. And yet when I read a 47-page article that not only described the problem, there was not one mention of faith. There was not mention of moral content. There was no discussion at all about the moral and spiritual crisis that these kids were going through. Instead, what they were recommending is moon bounces, eliminating uh, uh, honors classes that start at 7 in the morning. Throughout the whole 47-page discussion, there was no discussion or mention of faith in God. And so I would like to offer you a faith perspective on the problem and a faith remedy to the problem. And when I was looking for a model for what that looks like, I found it in Genesis with the uh, story of Joseph. Joseph, as you know, was from a, a dysfunctional Hebrew family of 13 boys. And he told his, his, his family that he could, God gave him the ability to interpret dreams and because they provoked anger and they sold his brother, sold him into slavery. But Joseph became the best slave. He was in the house of Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife lusted for him, but, but Joseph resisted because he had horizontal integrity and he had vertical, vertical integrity. It would be a sin against his God. And he was falsely in prison, where he became the best prisoner, where he languished for many years. And then Pharaoh had a dream that none of his, his experts could answer and they remembered that Joseph could interpret dreams. And he cleaned Joseph up, came before the Pharaoh, and said, I understand you can interpret dreams. And Joseph said, no, God does that. I'm merely the vessel. And he, so Pharaoh knew that he had integrity. And so he said, there'll be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, save up 20%, and appoint an overseer. And Pharaoh appointed an overseer in Joseph. 
the meaning of the story is that if, there, if we didn't have the powerful, discerning, wise Pharaoh, there would be no Joseph. Powerful, rich people, people in public office have to be wise enough to be able to dream bad dreams in good times, to be able to look above the horizon, to look above the power and esteem that they have and understand that a storm is coming and that storm is here and there's an opiate crisis. And so there, what, what the Pharaoh understood, he must do something unusual. So what did he do? He reached across race, class lines, into the prisons to empower a 31-year-old uneducated Hebrew. He did not select him because he was God-centered, but he was selecting him because of the secular consequence of Joseph's faith. And so I use this as a model in my book, The Triumph of Joseph, as a metaphor for what, where we should look for solutions. And therefore, I do a lot of work in inner cities uh, around the country in the most drug-infested, crime-ridden neighborhoods. Children are killing themselves not only with drugs, but violence and suicide. It all stems from the same source, and that is a feeling of emptiness, a lack of content, a lack of meaning in their lives that causes them to destroy themselves and others. And so, but I look for not two types of Josephs. The Joseph from Genesis, he was blameless. He was unfairly treated. He faced injustice, but he never succumbed to bitterness, and therefore God could use him in ways. But there are another type of Joseph who were drug addicts, who were gangbangers, who were prostitutes. But through God's grace, they have become transformed and redeemed, and therefore they are witnesses to others that redemption is possible. What I heard from Becky Savage was a mom who suffered. She has firsthand experience about what it's like and therefore she speaks with an authority when she suggested from her heart and the actions that she took to do something from her experience. And so what we have found around the country by going into these communities and looking for these types of Josephs and empowering them. And, and some of those, in other words, we have schools where there is drug and their gang, but what we do is recruit young adults who were themselves drug dealers sometimes. Some of them were drug addicts at one point, but through God's grace, grace they had been redeemed. And what we do is we put them into the school to work full time along with the staff and they become moral mentors and character coaches to the, to the kids because a Justice Department study said with all these youth killers, and that's the same problem, same group, same motivation, they asked these kids, they tried to find out was there any common characteristics of those who were youthful killers. They found there were no youth, uh, common characteristics, but what they did have in common was they told somebody in their group what they were going to do before they did it. The challenge is we as adults are not tuned into their wavelength. And therefore, what we did was take young adults four or five years older than those kids, some actually having graduated or dropped out of the schools, put them back into the schools full time where they can circulate and they become the big brothers, the big sisters. They, they become the people that the kids are able to, uh, to turn to in times of trouble and crisis and we may have 25 interventions in the course of a, of a day where kids are coming to the youth advisors and sharing with them things that they would not share with their parents or the teachers or security or their counselors. So you've got to understand that the, that the, that the, the answer to the problem can be found among those suffering the problem. But we've got to be able to think about uh, creative ways to give these young people a voice. Uh, someone once said that if our problem in America were economic, God would have sent an economist. If our problem was education, he would have sent an educator. But because our problem was sin, he sent a savior. And therefore, what we must do, ladies and gentlemen, is to be able to 
think outside of the box and come up with drug collections and, and but ask among those suffering the problem what are the solutions that they have and, and we must look for creative remedies among unusual sources. What we did some years ago in Washington DC, I got 30 black and brown inner city kids who were troublemakers but whose God's grace had been transformed. And I brought 30 kids from Springfield, uh, uh, Springfield, Missouri, Columbine, and I brought them together for three days in Washington, D.C., and we let them interact with one another. These are 30 inner city kids who had been transformed, and they had a chance to interact with suburban kids, white, uh, and the, the, the interaction was tremendous. Again, because the inner city kids who had found content and meaning to their life were able to share with them their journey and how they accomplish it. But it means that those other kids were served. In other words, what we need to do with young people is not in the process of giving them content and meaning to their lives. Nothing does it more than giving them someone else to serve so they can begin to understand that when they serve, they will be served. God bless you.